My name is Charlotte Ironman. I'm the guest curator. It was my great honor to be invited as an art historian to be the guest curator of a Pacific Standard Time exhibition. I think those of you who are here know what Pacific Standard Time is, um, an am amazing initiative by the Getty to bring together uh, the history of Los Angeles, art in Los Angeles from 1945 to 1980. This was the art museum founded in 1913 in that beautiful rotunda where we've just been enjoying each other's company. And now we're here to enjoy the wit and wisdom of Larry Bell, Betty Sarr, and Billy Al Bankston. Um, I should say a few words on behalf of the museum that it was a tremendous honor to work with them. They are visionary and professional and high level and inspiring and they are nimble. They roll with it. So I'm very <laughs> indebted. I've worked in a lot of institutions, academic and museums, and this was for me one of the absolute highlights of my professional experience. And I don't want to start weeping, but some of you have been so kind in your responses to the show. Um, I first want to thank Dr. Jane Pisano, the director of the museum, for her visionary support. This is an incredible institution. If you're not a member of the Natural History Museum, I personally ask you to join at whatever level you're able. This is one of our great civic institutions. Until 1965, it was the Los Angeles County Museum of History, Science, and Art. And art is back now because of the incredible vision and support of Jane, her senior staff, Karen Wise, Cynthia Warnham, who's here, uh, Tom Jacobson, Simon Adlin, with whom I worked very closely in exhibitions. And I can't thank everyone, because I know you want to hear the artist talk. You don't want to hear me give my like Academy Award speech. Um, but I'm so grateful to so many people, and it really does take a village to make an exhibition. Um, this exhibition would not be possible without the artists and the lenders. And I would like to ask, without further ado, that all the lenders and all the artists and all the gallerists who represent the artists or if you're from a foundation and you gave me permission to reproduce something, thank you so much. Would the artists and the lenders please stand? Everybody, stand up, you're here, stand up, Sam, stand up. You're standing up, yes you did. Thank you, Sam, thank you. The biggest lender to the exhibition is the Los Angeles County Museum of Art because this was their history, they started here. The works in the exhibition were overwhelmingly originally shown here, and the three artists that are so generous and so gracious and have been so welcoming and helpful and, and filled with good humor and delight, and all of the artists in the show who I worked with, I was very fortunate to have 11 living artists of the 22 in the exhibition. And we have to make an acknowledgement in RIP for June Wayne, who died in August. Um, but the artists, working with living artists is one of the great joys. And tonight we have, we have so many great artists. Tony Berlant is here. But tonight on the panel, we have Larry Bell, Betty Saar, and Billy L. Bankston, who were young artists when they first showed here. And I'd like to have a kind of an informal conversation. And we'll start with Larry, and then Betty, and then Billy L., and then we'll see where it goes. Um, there will be a quiz. I'd like to ask them what it was like for them as young artists to not just show at the exhibition here at the museum, because many of them were showing, Larry and Billy Al both showed in the late 50s, more than once. Billy Al and Betty both showed in the early 60s. Billy Al several times. Betty showed uh, work that I was able to track down through mutual friends and these kind of networks that we all have that lead us. Doing an exhibition is a lot of detective work. But what was it like to come to the museum as a young artist while you were studying? Larry, you were studying at Chouinard with um, Bob Irwin at the time. You were 18 or 19 years old. You told us at the Getty last week that it was one semester. But had you visited the museum before you went to art school? Was it a part of your life growing up here in LA? Yes, I, as a kid, my parents brought me and the, the school, uh, the grammar school and the junior high school I went to brought, brought the students here to you know, see this whale. I, I actually- This whale? I don't know if it's- That very whale? Well, I actually never looked up its asshole before. <laughs> it's a special thing. This is part of the new dynamic exhibition design the at the Natural History Museum. <laughs> Nor have you ever been able to see these works of art through its guts. No, no, but it, I, can't rem I can't remember the, the, too much about the art museum. 
I, I remember the rock collection and the uh, and gems and, and uh, the dioramas and all still here. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, it, 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 I when I came back to meet you about a week ago, it, I, it was the, the, the first time in you know fifty. Five years, I think that I was no, fifty years that I was here. Um, I, for the so, how is that? Fifty years later. Well, everything is not anywhere near as big as it was as, uh, <laughs> when I saw it last. There you are. <laughs> now you can hear Larry. What's what do you that? mean? Not well, as big. That, that's pretty. That's pretty. Well, big. I remember. You know, I, I just remember. The, be, I was here as a kid, and, I, and everything looked a lot bigger when you're a kid. That is true. And uh, uh, the rotunda hasn't changed very much. It's completely it's, restored. It's it's all seismically correct now, and it's beautiful and gleaming. What was it like in Bob Irwin's class? You were taking a watercolor class with him when you made that work, Rice yeah, Tea and yeah, Sino, that I tracked yeah, down yeah. in an old catalog. Yeah, well, it... it Irwin had, was an extremely charismatic teacher, and, and his first semester as a teacher was my first semester as an art student there. And your last, right? No, I was there a little less than two years. Uh, oh, um, I understood a kind of one semester. I lie a lot. Oh, you know? good. <laughs> you heard it from yeah. the artist. <laughs> that was the Getty Press Conference. Here we get the truth. <laughs> Well, that whale. You're distracted by the yeah. whale. <laughs> Why don't you meditate a little? Why don't you meditate a little about Irwin's class, and we'll come back to that when we're talking about school, because I, I want to jump over to Betty for a minute. Betty, when you showed here, it was 1961. You were a, still in art school, a young mother, and what we have in the show is a beautiful etching from 1961. You're not making work like that anymore. But what was it like for you in 1961 to have that show here at the museum? And you mentioned you'd come here as a girl. Well, that etching was part of a, a big sort of a crossroads for me. When I was a student at UCLA, I studied design. And I went to Long Beach State to get another teaching credential and was seduced by printmaking. And what? Why? What's seductive about printmaking? What? What is seductive about printmaking? The smell of the ink, the process of doing it, uh, and I was really in love with soft ground that you could put anything in it and lift it up and it would make an imprint. And with my um, previous schooling, which had been designed, which is more structured, it was really like the, um, the way over to the other side into fine arts. And in 61 was a uh, a time when uh, my youngest child was born then, and we had moved from the South Bay, from Redondo Beach, into Los Angeles. And I think that for that particular print, it was kind of recalling my feelings about what it like to, was like to live in Laurel Canyon. There had been a terrible fire there in 56, so there were lots of brambles and wild kinds of growths and new growth coming up. So. In a way, it was like documenting where I was living. And for that particular show, I think it was like an open competition to submit things, because I certainly was not known in the art world. And I was very thrilled to get that print accepted. And the curator, we should say, was Abria Feinblatt. That, that show in 1961 was only a print show, the annual that year. Works on paper. Works on paper, yes, I apologize. Works, works on, on paper. paper, right, because we have an Altoon drawing hanging yeah. with your print. So that was like a, a big breakthrough for me to have something that I had submitted and it was accepted and was shown. And I was sort of surprised that you tracked it down, I guess through a catalog or I'm something. I'm persistent and nerdy. <laughs> through a catalog, And yeah. that you included me in it because it, it brought back a lot of feelings about this museum. First as a child, as a student coming on field trips. And um, one time my aunt and my mother brought me to see the Dolls of Shirley Temple. 
And that was a piece that I remember. Right. That was they have a huge thing. Hollywood collection yes. here, which may not be known because cultural history is one of their collecting areas. So wait, Shirley Temple's dolls? Dolls. Her, really? People sent her dolls. That were, oh, you know, it was her collection. So she put them in the museum, and there was a little room filled with her dolls. That left an imprint. I'm just calling, recalling my imprints of, of this museum, the dioramas, um, just the feeling about it. You know, it was sort of mysterious, like when your kid, like, like Larry said, everything seems to be bigger, especially this particular bone thing. Yeah, well, but. this is really quite dramatic for us. You in the audience are missing our special perspective. Yeah. I mean, you know, and a, and a sort of sense of mystery about the dioramas because it's slightly dark in there and just really didn't give you nightmares, but it made you think a lot. They're cinematic. Yeah. Yes. Then um, my history continued with this museum because when... Uh, I was dating Dick Sarr. We would hang out in the Rose Garden. And he worked here, right? Your former and then, husband. Yeah, later on, he worked here. He, um, we would bring it, when we had kids, we brought our kids to have picnics. He was a scientific illustrator, and he worked in scientific illustration. In fact, I asked my daughter if she had any memories of this museum. She said, I remember we were on a field trip, and there was a picture of Dad drawing something. And then he became interested in conservation and restoration and worked with, with the person who did that here and later on went into conservation and restoration. And I just have just really lovely feelings about this place of, uh, of coming here. And the last time I came here, that uh, there was a show on bogs of Europe, which is very strange and mysterious from things that they had found in the bogs, and the, the installation itself was very curious. So that stuck with me. And it, when, every time I come, I head for the gift shop because they always have something I can't resist. And then <laughs> it's, it's just a really nice place to be. The other show I remember was um, pre-Columbian Mexico. Yeah. They had a great show. One of the points we make in the, in the materials about the exhibition, and there's a video that will be online soon, and the artists have been interviewed for the video, and I was interviewed, is the point that although Pacific Standard Time is about contemporary art in Southern California from 1945 to 1980, that this was the exhibition, you know, this place is where you came to see all the great artworks of the world, that ancient Mexico and mm -hmm. Leonardo da Vinci and arts of ancient China and Indian art and you know, all kind of, kind of contemporary photography, that you could see everything here. Billy Al, you want to tell us about skipping school? About oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna, oh, do you uh, want to finish, finish your thought, Betty? What? No, I'm Do you want to circle back? No, I'm fine. Keep going, honey. Billy we'll circle Al back. A, we, Billy we, Al has a few words to tell me. Uh, 1950, 51, and 52, I went to Manual Arts High School over there. Mm -hmm. I was not very fond of high school, so I spent all my time here. It was free in those days. And they had a real sweet little cafeteria downstairs with mediocre coffee. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I walked around here all the time and looked at shit, but I had no idea what I was going to do. Just kept looking. And it was a nice place to spend time. It was a good place. I think your quotable quote was that when you're a truant, they don't look for you at the museum. They absolutely don't. <laughs> a unless they want to give you a reward. Uh, I mean, it's... Uh, well, that's now. Uh, and, and if I'd sneak back in the school, the uh, vice principal that marched me to his office, and I said, well, he'd say, where were you? And I said, the museum. And he said, oh, yeah. And uh, then I'd tell him what I did, and he'd say, oh, yeah. And he'd just say, get out of here. So I could, I mean, every time I'd go in there, they'd, they'd take me to the vice principal's office when they caught me, and he'd just say, get out of here. And, uh, <laughs> and would you, I mean, Betty was talking about exhibitions that made an impact on her, and, you know, the collections, the, that it's the dioramas and the rocks and the historical collections and the cultural collections. Now, when you all came here, and I'll just ask the question and you can answer it as you wish, because we don't want to just have a kind of one, two, three thing. I do want you to converse as well. Did you sketch? Did you come here and draw when you were skipping school? Or did you just come and look and hang no, out and drink uh, the bad coffee? Not me. Uh, I mean, I, these guys might have known they were going to be artists, but I sure didn't know. Uh, yeah. I mean, 
So it, you had no awareness of that at Manual Arts? Pardon me? You had no awareness that you were interested in being an artist at that point? Uh, I was interested in art, but I had no idea I was going to be an artist. I thought maybe I was going to be a potter because I was pretty exceptional in that department and I won a lot of drawing prizes. I can't imagine I did that. Uh, That'll be our next show. Oh, no, it won't. <laughs> uh, I predated Baldessari with destruction on that department. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Inside <laughs> joke, we'll explain. And it was on oatmeal paper. Remember oatmeal pe paper. God, that's awful stuff. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it, I don't know. Do museums have any impact? Uh, other than you, you can cut school and get away with it. I mean, it, uh, and, you know, they still haven't bought enough of my paintings, so it doesn't affect me too much. Uh, I think we'll treat do museums have an impact as a rhetorical question at the moment. But Larry mentioned the asshole and I can't find it. <laughs> He's got the prime view. He's right Where there. is it exactly, Larry? I think, I think it might be metaphorical. Is that a pair of high heels hanging down there or a microphone? <laughs> We're very distracted by the whale up here. You don't have the view, you poor bitch. Did you, I mean, L Billy Al, since Betty mentioned exhibitions, do you have memories of exhibitions that were here? until? Nuh -uh, not a one. What about when you had your own? Not the animals? Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, the, the stuff around there, yeah, you walk around. I, I also like... What liked, about the glass? Where? I love the glass, yeah, I love the Persian glass. That, but, you know, it's sort of strange. There's this gawky high school kids sitting around looking at Persian glass. I got a little embarrassed. Did you know about the secret Pollock hanging in the education wing? Oh, I absolutely wing? knew about that. All right, I tell, also tell the, the people. Albers. Well, it's, it, I thought it was pretty stupid. I think anybody in, at that time thought it was pretty stupid. The painting or the fact that it was hanging in a hallway? Both. <laughs> so the, the museum in 1951, the annual exhibition, so those of you who have seen the exhibition, and if you haven't, there will be an opportunity after this to, to go up. There will be a little time before the museum has to close um, until about 8.45. But the museum bought a Jackson Pollock painting for a very small amount of money in 1951, and it was very controversial. And that was the same year that the annual included those works. So art students would know that it was hiding in like an education room because they made a rule against showing that kind of art that didn't last very long because clearly the rest of this exhibition shows a lot of that. But that's presently on view at LACMA. Okay, what do you two come up with down there? Betty and I were, I asked her when she was going, uh, decided she was going to be an artist and she said when she got the uh, NEA grant, and I asked her the date. I forgot already. And um, <laughs> I mentioned that I got the first one. <laughs> so it was a few years before Betty's. But I knew I was an artist before then. Oh, good for you. But Betty, when you... <laughs> I, uh, no, no, the reason I knew is because I really couldn't do anything else. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was yeah. terrible. I couldn't do a damn thing. But isn't that what we learned from Steve Jobs uh, in these, all these memorials? We've been hearing that you have to do what you love and follow your vision and follow your instinct. Because well, he sounds to me like an artist. He reminds me of, of you all and the other artists well, yeah. that I talked to about that following yourself. But there was no future in it. Well, Believe here you me. are. Well, <laughs> that serendipitous who the hell knows how that happened yeah uh, I mean and now I'm beginning to think there's no future in it again uh, even with Pacific Standard Time driving this big LA art world bus into the hearts and minds of uh, PST sounds like the wrong thing to me yeah uh, it's uh, you know fortunately there's nothing upstairs that's digital so I don't have anything to piss and moan about but um, it's, uh, it's, it's a different world. Betty, did you have a feeling when you showed here in 1961, did you, did you feel when you had that work selected by the curator, given that you'd submitted it, did that make you, you have a recognition, I am an artist, or did you feel that you were on a path? I can't remember that far back. It just seems like when I look at that painting, I knew that I submitted it, and... Um, it was, I guess, important at the time. It was, because I found it in the catalog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then I left printmaking and went into something else that was more fun. 
And, uh, tell, us, tell us about that for people who may not be familiar with your work. Oh. Your work in assemblage? Oh, the, cro the, uh, the crossroads there were, uh, I found a window somewhere in Big Sur, and then I start framing parts of prints in it, and then making drawings, and that's how I got into assemblage. But before then, I saw at the Pasadena Museum the work of uh, Joseph Cornell, so that, that kind of let me know, oh, you can make art out of stuff. And I always collected stuff as a kid, so when I had them, I think the thing that was, from, that was really important for me is that I had a really wild imagination and I could see things from finding things and putting things together and see something else. And I think that that's what keeps me going now. I don't know if it's art, but I have a lot of fun doing it. I think the verdict it is in, okay. and it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. artists invite us to see the world in a new way. And what's interesting for me, working with these artists and all the living artists in the show, is that this is where they started. And many of them are, yeah. are making work that are, is very different than where you started. Um, but yet there's a resonance with these early works with what you do now. And I think, you know, that, that question of sort of where do we begin and how do we get here and here we are now. I mean, you were very young artists starting off, not knowing it yet. You all, you stayed in Los Angeles. You continued on your path. I mean, Larry, you dug out your watercolor from your mother's collection, as I recall. <laughs> It took a while to find it. Tony Berlant is here. We had a lot of back and forth. I'm still looking for that. I know it's here. I know it's somewhere. That work you showed in 1960. So what is it like for your work to be kind of pulled out of an archive? This is a Larry question now. Well. <laughs> or answer I, another question. Or it's just skip that. Just talk about whatever you want. I have an awful lot of stuff. And uh, th when my mother passed away, most of the things that were mementos ended up in my storage. And uh, that watercolor was one of them. I suspect that uh, the, the most profound memory I have about the, the time that that piece was shown here was how astonished and pleased my parents were that uh, that, uh, that something that their son had done was in a museum. It was, uh, you know, part of a of some of something which uh, I, I'm totally convinced that they thought I was retarded and was uh, <laughs> and, uh, had uh, had no future whatsoever. Did it boost your allowance? <clears throat> well, they were right in some sense, you know, uh, uh, but. Uh, my memory of, of the time was, uh, was how pleased they were. I don't really remember too much about the, the show or... It was 1959. Yeah, I, you know... How old were you in 59? I was 19. I was, at, I was at art school. I was done at art school, you know. And, and what was it like to study with Bob Irwin as a 19-year-old? Well, it, my first semester at Chouinard was his first semester teaching. Right. And uh, uh, it was, except it was before, uh, before I, I, that watercolor came on the, just uh, at the beginning of the time when I was thinking I wasn't fit for art school either. And, and so I'd been there a year or something like that. And, and you, you mentioned uh, in another context recently that you went to Schoenard thinking you'd become an animator. Yeah, it was a training ground for Disney's people. And, and uh, I liked to draw cartoons when I was in high school. and, and when my parents told me on graduation that I could go to work, go to school, go into the army, but I couldn't sit around and watch TV anymore, uh, uh, I was obliged to make a choice between those three things. N never occurred to me that there might be other options too. And, uh, but I decided to go to uh, uh, a professional school and learn how to do something that I could get a job maybe at. And, uh, uh, of course, at that point, I was sure I was going to get a job being uh, working for Disney, and and then 
the instructors at the school, the, 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 uh, actually Billy substituted uh, once or twice for Ir in Irwin's painting class. Do you remember that? Uh, and uh, I got to know s the people that were in, uh, in the uh, painting department and I liked I just like the charisma of those people as opposed to the more professional people that taught very technical kinds of things like, you know, perspective drawing and design and stuff like that. And I decided I want to be a painter. I want to be like those guys. Yeah. And, well, it, yeah. what's fascinating doing the research for the show is all the interconnections that so many of the artists shared studios and there were teacher-student relationships and generational relationships. Billy, you tell a funny story about sharing a studio with Irwin. And when I, I met you back in February, I think it was, and I visited you and Wendy Al at the studio, you mentioned um, we have a lot of great work, first of all, of your own and artists that you collect. And I had just met with Joni Gordon, who's here, and Joni and, and Monty Gordon lent a great 1960 Irwin that was shown here. And I mentioned to you that I'd just been to their house and seen their collection, and I found this great 1960 Irwin, and he showed there too, and you started telling me stories about, you know, a certain bar you used to hang out in. And you, you informed me that the name of that painting, Lucky You, was not a horse at the racetrack, as Joni suspected, Joni, have I told you this yet? Did you know that? Um, but Billy Albankson informed me that that was the name of a bar. So, so much of this LA art world we're talking about is the hanging out and the socializing and the schmoozing and the professional and social relationships that come out of, of that charismatic art world that Larry was talking about. It was a bar in a Mexican restaurant. Do you remember how much a beer was? <laughs> a nickel? Ten. <laughs> Those were the good old days. <laughs> but there's so much of that, and, and you know, we have a lot of people who are here in the audience who are collectors and journalists and writers and, and artists in their own right, uh, museum colleagues. We, we all think we know so much about this period, and yet, for me, the ex experience of Pacific Standard Time and doing this show in particular is how much we learn. Do you feel like... You've known each other for such a long time. You've been here for a long time. You've had long careers. Do you feel like this experience, the specific standard time experience, you're learning new things too? No, but I remember when Larry was a kid. And uh, he's still a kid. And, yeah, I know. And Altoon, <laughs> Altoon named him Larry La. <laughs> yeah. But Larry said something about the people that he met and that he liked them. And what I remember about uh, coming, uh, becoming an artist, because I'm older than these guys, so I experienced different It doesn't things. show, Betty. Oh, well, thank you. But um, I was raised in Pasadena with a very bourgeois upbringing, you know, going to teas and all of that kind of thing. But Where you I developed a certain taste for hats. <laughs> yeah, I never felt really comfortable until I met, um, well, I was an art student passing the city college, but actually uh, African Americans were not accepted in art schools here in Chenard and other places like that. So you had to go to a, a university, that's where I went to UCLA, to take an art class. And it was racism, I didn't know what it was then, I just know that I couldn't get into those places. But then later on I met a man who went to the Cleveland School of Art, Curtis Tan, he was a, a jeweler out here. And he had friends, uh, a man named uh, Tony Hill, who made ceramics. And there were uh, African-American people who were in the arts. And it was like finding my long lost tribe, that, that there were other artists. And we did things and became an art community of African-Americans in Los Angeles. Which and is what the Hammer exhibition explores. Yes. Which yes. Betty's also in. Right, which is some of those people were still there. But it took a long time finding, but then I just remember a personal feeling of relaxing as, oh yeah, this is where I belong. This feels really comfortable here. And being in, art, in the art world, in a, another sense, is, is larger than that. And I've moved beyond just African-American artist friends and could go any place, I guess, to find artists. And it, it is like a, a larger community because there's even the people sitting here, whether you're a collector, or just a, an appreciator of art, there is a different feeling in the art world than, say, for instance, being a doctor or a lawyer or a business person or something like that. Have and you ever been one of those? 
never wanted to. No, but I wonder if they feel the same way as we do. I don't know. Because I know they, they seem to hang out with themselves. Fun. Dentists usually do, and so do uh, 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 eye doctors and things like that. They always seem to hang out in a tribe. So they probably yeah. just think, oh, I found, finally saw it, they know met that someone that wasn't an fun. asshole. But isn't the... Well, you <laughs> never know. You know. Isn't the art, before we diverge into <laughs> well, the eye doctor so cabal... No, well, hold on now. Everything today is sociological. They don't talk about art anymore. Everything is categorized, and it's all sociologized. Instead of being, this is an art show. But it, instead, it's an art show by African Americans or by this or by that, or people who drive pickup trucks, or, you know, it can be, but it has to be socialized. Do you talk to your doctor about art? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? My proctologist? <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a long history of the uh, art collecting doctor. On that note, <laughs> don't you think the art world, though, is, I always think about it as a kind of like an ecosystem, and there are all these kind of interconnected ponds, and you've got the artists and the collectors and the dealers and the curators and the journalists and the writers and the, you know, and the enthusiasts and, and then people who just like to go to a party because it is a lot of fun. It, it seems like back in those days, LA was a much smaller city and it seemed like a very intimate community. There weren't a lot of galleries. I mean, now, and part of the specific standard time phenomenon that we're all participating is, in is the self-consciousness about Los Angeles as an international arts center. And that is not a recent phenomenon. This is something that's been going on for, you know, the establishment of, of that has been going on for many decades. And this institution played a role in that. That's one of the things that this show is about. But do you feel like that your lives as artists, that part of the evolution that we're talking about in the exhibition, of course it's about artistic style, it's about individual careers, but also our city has changed so much. And I mean, I'm, I'm from elsewhere, but like a lot of people, I chose Los Angeles. I feel like this is, this is my home, this is where I, I belong. I'm a Midwesterner by birth, but this is where I wanna be. You came here from Oklahoma as a young- Kansas, please. Kansas, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm confusing you with another Oklahoma artist. is much more highbrow. <laughs> is it? <laughs> I guess we were talking about Oklahoma, though, last week. You, no. Uh, Wendy, well, Wendy had done some important research on the I, I Gautier buying. I try and be from Oklahoma. I'm an honorable, honorary right. An Oakey. honorary Oki. But the yeah. point is, y you both are natives. Larry and Betty are natives of Southern California. You moved here. How old were you when your family moved here, Billy? Oh, uh, I, I'm really a hick. Uh, I didn't really get here permanently until I was in the ninth grade. But you all you stayed. Hmm? You stayed a here. I didn't. I you moved were a away. Teenager. Well, when I got here permanently, I started out in the Second World War because my dad came and worked in the shipyards, and then oh, we yeah. went back and forth and back and forth. It's a real boring story. But I guess, Larry, because you maintain a studio, are you talking about your studio in Taos? Yeah, I moved to Taos in 72. I had closed my studio here, and I moved up there. It wasn't until about nine, nine years, ten years ago that I took a studio back. And, uh, oh, I, I thought you maintained the studio consistently. No. Oh, that's interesting. Well, tell no, us about that. No, ironically, when I was start, made the decision to, to take a studio back in, in L.A., uh, I, I was... I always stay in the same hotel in, in Venice. When I came, when I c would come back from Taos once a month for a day or two, I mean, I, I came back every month just about for 30 years. And uh, uh, my studio was in Venice and uh, had been in Venice. And, and when I came back, at one point, I decided I wanted to have a studio back here again. And by some, I don't know, weird twist of fate, my old studio was for lease. And I called the number, and it was the same landlord. And he said, oh, come on back. <laughs> I'll rent it to you. And, uh, and so I just moved back into my old digs after 30 years. And, uh, uh, and that I guess that's why I thought it was continuous. I didn't realize you had the nine-year break. 30-year break. Oh, I thought you said it was nine. 30, it was nine 30 years? years since I've been back. Oh, since you've been back. Yeah. Do you still but have to pay first and last? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I named a sculpture once first and last. <laughs> <laughs> Did you miss it when you weren't here? Yeah, I miss the ocean. I'm, um, I like Venice, uh, but I like Taos too, but the, the interesting thing about both places is that the air is very clean in both places, and, and uh, uh, that means a lot. But is the quality of light different in Taos than it is here? Well, the quality of light is probably different, but uh, it's, I, it wasn't the quality of the light that was, it was the quality of the life. I liked, I left, I left Venice because I fell in love with a beautiful gal and I wanted to get her away from my hairy leg friends. That would, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and it worked out good because we stayed together for 30 years and then when she finally dumped me, I decided I could better come back to Venice. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, We're happy you did. <laughs> Where I was, where I had always felt right at home, and I. I, I well, we're like, glad you're back. Yeah, me but too. But you're back and forth all the time. I'm like a migrant fruit picker. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. we have to take a moment to just be especially appreciative that Larry's here tonight because his third grandchild, Ruby, was born on Tuesday. So here's to Ruby. Here's to life. Larry's here. I told him that we would acknowledge Ruby. And it's a poignant, you know, it's a poignant week for, for losses in our, our world, but there's new life as well. And Larry said, are we on for this chat on Thursday? Because I really should be in Taos right now. And I said, yes, we're on, but if you need to go and be with Ruby, we can't compete with that. So we're very, very, very grateful that he's here. And Ruby is two days old, and he will go tomorrow. But how is that experience of the road, all that backing and forthing? I mean, how, how does it affect the way you think about your work and your you know, your creative I, process, does it, does it figure sense, in? I have three homes. I have one in Taos, I have one in Venice, and I have my One in your car. car. And, uh, <laughs> and it, I, I always try and do it in one jump. It's 16 to 18 hour drive. I love the desert. It's different every time you drive it. And, and I like the drive. I have my little rituals of places to stop and get gas and Eliminate gas and uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know. There's a book in there, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. No, I like. I think I like all three places of, of equally. Equally. Um, and uh, it says that the, my life is good. I'm quite happy actually right now. And now that the baby is here, there's one thing less to think about. And. and uh, no, it all begins. I, I, yeah, and I just put together an a, 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 a annex to my studio in Venice where I pulled out some old work that looks pretty good. And I, I, in, I decided to take advantage of all the visitors coming to L.A. And, and do a show in my studio, but it wasn't big enough, so I took the place next door and did a show in that. And it, it's sort of... So I started out with a lot of work that was made in Venice and, it, and, and put up these things that probably nobody's seen. Uh, so is it, is it invitation only? How, it do, is, we, how uh, do we see your show? Apart, appointment only, and um, I, I don't want to have to clean the floor that often, actually. So, <laughs> well, uh, have you documented it? My son, who's in the back doing a video of this, is taking care of the documentation of all of that. We'll look for that. And we should mention, I mean, all of you were in so many Pacific Standard Time shows. And just to give a plug to this project and the amazing Getty Foundation and the Research Institute that drove that, there's an incredible website called pacificstandardtime.org with all of the exhibitions and the events and the galleries. And, you know, I should say that to do any of these projects, it's completely impossible without the artists and the collectors and the dealers. And we could not do what we do without the support of all of those constituencies and museum colleagues, of course. And you know what's incredible is how many shows you all are in. Betty had an incredible opening three weeks ago at Robertson Tilton, this amazing installation that is called Red Time. 
And I get invitations from all of you and your galleries, like, you know, it's like three times a week there's another opening. Ed Moses has personally emailed me three times this week. Another opening, another opening. Well, you missed it's a couple. kind of amazing. <laughs> but Betty has this show that just opened that's not part of Pacific Standard Time, but the timing is nice. And you all have to see this amazing installation she made. And I said, Betty, it reminds me of Matisse's Red Studio at MoMA. And she said, well, I was at his house this summer. That was my inspiration. True. And it's, it's wonderful for me, I mean, because I'm an historically oriented curator, but I love working with living artists, that that dialogue between old and new, that the literalness of the work that you made, Betty, that 1961 <coughs> etching, or Larry's 1959 watercolor, or Billy Al's paintings from the early 60s, you know, your, your work resonates with that but not in a literal way. I mean, you're all doing such different things. And, and what is it like for you as artists to be going to all these events and, you know, and, and Betty, you're, you're here with your work from 1961 and then you've got your opening and you're in like, I, I got your newsletter, you're in 15 Pacific Standard Time shows, it seems really? like. I, it looked like that. Yeah. I have a tendency toward hyperbole, but you're in a lot of shows. Yeah. But let's talk about the ones that we share. We're okay. Mocha. Mocha. And um, the Getty. The Getty. And where else? You're the only one in the Hammer show. I don't know. I haven't gone to many shows. Mm. We'll have to take you on a field trip. How? Uh -uh. But, but Billy, you're such a generous lender, also. I mean, you lent oh, to sure. you lent to works as a collector as well as as an artist. How many works did you lend, either of your own or of uh, of other works? Wendy. Many. Wendy keeps track of everything. A lot, though. I mean, when I came to visit you, you had like a, there was like a revolving door on the studio. It's like, okay, next, <laughs> right? You had a lot of visitors because that's one of the phenomena of the Pacific Standard Time show. When you talk to the museums and you talk to the galleries and the collectors, they've had, you know, 35 visits that week of people coming to see them. And, you know, this, this whole project wouldn't be possible if people didn't open up, you know, their collections because so much of it is still in private collections. I'm right. a great cook. It's true. And I have a lot of good espresso machines. <laughs> Makes it easy. And a flair for fashion. But are you having fun with this Pacific Standard Time thing? Are you... It's fascinating. It's like What's looking fascinating at bugs. about it? Uh, well, it, uh, again, as I say, it seems to be so little... I'm really bitching here, but I shouldn't be. Uh, it just seems to be so much about sociology and so little about what I consider art. Really? Yep. That's an opinion. I think we have art upstairs. I didn't say you didn't, but I, I'm talking about the, the, the group, the whole thing. It seems like you have to be a, a this or a that or a this or a that. But that's one of the reasons, I'm just gonna make a shameless plug for the show that I curated. One of the reasons that I love this show is that there's so much diversity in it. Well, yours isn't that way. Thank I'm you. Not, I, I, didn't, I didn't throw that at you, but no, this no, is no. about a certain time and a certain place, which makes sense because it is about art. And it, this was definitely, this was the only gig in town, really, that was, that was a big deal. You mean this museum back in the yes, day? Yes, yes. And had it not been for this museum and uh, Jim Elliott and a few other people that were working And James there. Burns before him and Abrea Feinblatt. Well, I didn't know them, but uh, they, they gave me a big kick in the ass and got me going. It was really good. And, uh, and you showed, Billy L showed in the annuals of 1959-1960 and also in the, the show that our show culminates with, Six More, which was a pop art show. I never curated won a prize. By a Guggenheim curator. <laughs> and yet here you are. I never won a prize. I'll give you a prize. I'll too give late. You one too. Good. What do I get? A cigar. Lunch. Jeez. He's taken care of. Oh. <laughs> I'm so thankful. Thank you. Betty, did you I mean, did you did it matter not to win the prize? Or was it enough to just be a young be artist and have your work to included? Be in there. It was you know, prizes are just given by a few people, but yeah, a lot prizes of people can see be the political, show. right? You know, well, a lot of people see the show. That would be interesting to have the prize winners up. Yeah, I didn't take yeah. that path. Well, you should. 
Well, I, yeah. I, I did some, I, but I didn't do all, because for me that wasn't, I mean, that's probably another conversation for another time. Well, no, no, because this is really what it boils down to is about opinion at the time. And, uh, or even at this time. At this time, it's exactly, yeah. that's what because I'm trying to Because they, they had lots on of and on people, and on. yeah. yeah. And uh, unequivocal, flat out, this is the best thing being done. But you know, what's interesting for me as the, an art historian and a curator, and I did all this nerdy research in the LACMA library, and you know, God bless the LACMA librarians, and uh, I have to thank Taras, who's here. Where are you, Taras? Wave. Who, where are you? I know you're here somewhere. He, um, Taras, who works in the print department with Britt Salveson, who's the department head from LACMA, helped me find these things that were, that were in such deep storage. We, he'd call me with weekly updates, like, we're still looking for it. We're still looking for it. And the things that won the prize are the things that went into LACMA's collection. So everything on loan from LACMA won the prize. But there were a lot of things that won the prize that either I couldn't possibly track down or it didn't strike me as particularly interesting. And what I was interested in with the perspective of history, of you know doing this show now in 2011 and reading all those old catalogs, was coming across your names. All of you living artists, right? That how many of the artists who are our LA artists, our Pacific Standard Time, you know, core, were showing here as very young people. And did you, when you showed here, for example, when the shows were juried, the annuals were juried, in 1959, Larry, David Smith was on the jury. Did that make an impact on you? Did you know who David Smith was? Did that? No, I didn't. You know Elmer who Bischoff David was Smith on the jury. Was. I didn't know who Elmer Who was Bischoff the art critic? Was. I, uh, From the Baltimore Sun. In 59? Yeah. Is that who the art critic was? I have it in. No, Henry was not the. In 59? I have to check my notes. I don't want to commit to anything on the record until I check my no, notes. No, I'm talking about the art critic that was a juror. In 59? I don't know. In 59, I know it was Bischoff and David Smith, and David we'll find Smith. out the third one, and I'll get back to you all. But in 60, it was Clement Greenberg, Henry Francis, and Diebenkorn. But did the juries make an impact on you? Did that, is that something that you thought about or you, you talked about? You gambled with them. I didn't know who it's those people were. It's just a name. Larry, you did too. Because we talked about them in those days. Uh -oh. What's that? That was mine. Sorry. Okay. Right. Uh, a little drama. Time for some performance art. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we should say also that um, because the space, I knew that, that I would have that space. I knew that I had that amount of wall space. I knew that I had those dimensions. So the works that I selected were based on reading all the catalogs. And when I would read your names, I was like, oh my god. Oh my God. And I found out things like Louise Bourgeois showed at the museum in 1946. Gustin had a show here. Beckman had a show here. I mean, this place is fascinating. It's LACMA's prehistory. It's excavation. But, you know, what's really kind of amazing is just the, the breadth of what was shown here. Photographs were shown. A lot of sculpture was shown. Peter Volkless was showing here. Another very important artist and teacher. Those teacher-student relationships are extremely important. Hans Burkhardt was Tony Berlant's teacher. Rico Lebrun was John Baldessari's teacher. Laura Sir Feidelson was Helen Lundeberg's teacher. You studied with Irwin. Um, now, well, the, yeah. The, I didn't, uh, I came, to art school knowing nothing about art, and my intention was not to be in art, but to be in, uh, work for Disney, and, and That didn't uh, work out for you. I didn't, well, I just never gave any thought to uh, what art was, and But you I, did it, you did things, right? Well, you just kept making things. No, I was infected by the, by the charm of the, the people that were involved with making things, and I wanted to be like them. But isn't that great that you didn't yeah, go work for Disney? Yeah, it was fantastic, but it didn't give me much art history. It was, um, the, what I was infected with was, how, you know, what a great guy Bankston was, and Irwin, and Ken Price, and, and the rest of the gang that were hanging around my scene. That was the limit of my exposure to art, really, was the intensity with which they pursued their art and their work and 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 so I, I learned quite vicariously how serious uh, it, one had to be to get something 
uh, that was interesting going. And the only thing that was of, of uh, importance to me was that uh, I I've, I've was recognized as a peer by these people who were immediately surrounding me. And I uh, felt so honored to to be included as part of the gang. And, uh, and you it, still are. Well, but the, old, the gang's gone, you know. Everybody's gone a different way. It's not, a, not the same social club that it was. No. And, uh, 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 and, for, and that's, that's, that's probably for the better. Uh, but that's something that Betty alluded to. That's not something that you were really able to participate in, that, that until you developed your own community. Yes. Right, exactly. that 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 you know, and and that's something that we could make observations about, you know, the world in general. Um, but as the experience of of showing here and and being at the museum, you know, did it did it give you more confidence as an artist? Yes, it did. But I'm a little bit tired of talking about history. Okay, let's talk about now. How let's is it? Talk about now. Okay, we're here now. I want to give you all some minutes to kind of wrap up because we've been talking for almost an hour. And just what's it like to be here now? That's a, an excellent segue, Betty. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was just thinking how much easier it is to be an artist now because, well, I'm on in all these shows. That's nice, too, but it doesn't really get to where I am right now when I'm in the studio and how much pleasure <coughs> I get from making art and how, how nice it is to find something and kind of play the shaman and translate it into something that somebody's going to label art. I don't know how these guys feel about it, but it's just a, a really nice uh, place to be in my life. I'm in my last few decades, I suppose. But uh, I'm still trucking, and it still feels good. Yay! <laughs> Mr. Bankston? Jesus, it's just my job, you know. It's been my job for 50 years, and I take it seriously. And uh, uh, does it feel like a job? I don't know what any other job feels like. It feels like my job, and uh, it's it's a job that demands certain skills and a hell of a lot of uh, truthfulness, and. And At which you excel. No. Yes. And a big ego, by the way. <laughs> uh, 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 because if, if you're doing something that you really haven't seen before, you have to look at it and be pretty sure that uh, you, know, you just aren't shoveling shit against the tide. For, well, on that note, you made a gondola in the Venice Biennale for a big event. I did not make event. the gondola. I thought you made a gondola. I, I had it painted. Well, that you made something. I, I, that's it's a my Duchampian gesture. That's my first real modern work of it's art. It's actually a very I didn't make it. gesture. Like everybody else today right, in it's the like Jeff Koons. Does, doesn't make anything. But you directed it. You made it happen. Tell us about Venice and Venice no. and your participation in that. Oh, Venice and Venice was uh, Venice and Venice. Uh, Venice, it, California, it, and Venice, Italy. It was a great idea, and Tim Nye's idea. Yeah. Tim, Tim, I thought it was a brilliant idea. Brilliant guy. Uh, and he worked like a dog getting it together. This was last June yeah. at the Venice and, Biennale uh, at the opening. You know, there's a lot of Venice that wasn't in Venice, and. Uh, I don't know what it meant. It was, it was sort of fascinating. I, I, I did the best I could do. But it's, again, it's like history. And uh, uh, Venice used to be a slum. You know, We all moved there because it was the cheapest goddamn place in town outside of Pasadena, which had smog. Uh, How long have you been in your place in Venice? 62. Uh, 1962. Yeah, and before that, I was on uh, Pier Avenue with Ken, 50, from 50. Ken uh, Price? Yeah, 58 until then. And Larry was across the street with Altoon, and Erwin uh, was across the street with uh, Chaz Garabedian, 
And, and Sam and, Amato. Huh? And Sam Amato. Sam, uh, well, Sam was there first, and then Chaz came in later. Uh, who else was out there, Lair? Alan Lynch. You had to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> this no, is like Alan, art world Alan, monopoly. Alan was not there. Alan came in when I, uh, over, over, uh, uh, but, uh, oh, Moses, was Moses around at the time? Or did no. he go and try and he cut it off, in New York? He was off in Spain. Spain yeah. yeah. And Betty, you've lived in the same place in Laurel Canyon for? About 45 years. 45 years. Yeah. So there's, you're rooted. You're rooted in Venice. Betty's rooted in Laurel Canyon. Larry's rooted between Taos, his car, and Venice. Does that sense of place, I mean, do you feel that, that's, do you feel that? rootedness here? I do. Yeah, I do. Well, I'm I have so much I'm stuff. stuff. <laughs> I have so much stuff. It's, it has it's, to be somewhere. Yeah. It's miserable, but except I'm extremely happy because I married it, well. It shows. <laughs> it shows. Well, I think that we should have final thoughts because we've been talking for an hour. I thought we did have our final thoughts. Larry, final thought? I'm glad that it's the final thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, it's been a pleasure to be here and be with these people and, and you, Charlotte. And, and uh, the show is great fun to look at. I'm glad I don't have to look at it any longer. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and I don't mind these bones at all. I love, I don't <laughs> the bones are good. I, They're good bones. As much as I, I, I love the show uh, that I'm in upstairs, I, I find the general contents of this museum much more interesting than anything upstairs. We celebrate it all. <laughs> Betty, uh, final thoughts? Well, I'm very pleased to be included in the exhibition. I think you did a really good job. And I appreciate each person who sit here in these uncomfortable chairs <laughs> listening to us jabber away. And thank you for coming, and thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Oh. Billy? I agree with both of these cats. <laughs> and I wish I was a lot slicker than I am, half as slick as you. <laughs> well, I want to thank the artists so much. And I just noticed that Stephanie's here. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I want to thank the artists on the stage, the artists who are here, the artists who aren't here. There are about 50 things going on every night, all the time, now that we're in wow. Pacific Standard Time. I, of course, want to thank the lenders, the museums, um, LACMA, the Orange County Museum of Art, the San Diego Museum of Art, and the Crocker Museum, and also thank all the, the dealers and the collectors and the friends and enthusiasts and supporters and all of you for coming, and especially the Natural History Museum for being brave enough to take on this crazy art show. Thank you so much. Ooh, Charlotte, great. Yeah. Yeah.